Hello there, wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you're at. This is uh, David Roach, Quantum Economics and Independent Strategy. We are talking today about uh, digital currencies in China. Now, <clears throat> first of all, I need to step back a second and talk about what our thesis about digital assets and uh, cryptocurrencies and central bank digital currencies is. Essentially, the credibility of digital currencies, as with any currency, depends on its network. It was used by enough people in a trouble-free way, then it will really attain critical mass. <clears throat> in the old days, central banks used to back the currency they issued is gold. Since the end of Bretton Woods, that's over. So what is the difference between a digital currency and a fiat currency? Some would say, well, the backing of the central bank and beyond the central bank of the legitimate, or at least the government of the country, is the reason why fiat currencies persist. Digital currencies, on the other hand, unless they are central bank digital currencies, don't enjoy the same backing. However, digital currencies, private sector digital currencies, if they can overcome the problems of a lack of network, if they can overcome the problems of volatility, which makes them less of a means of transaction, less of a measure of value, and less of a store of wealth than a traditional currency, then they would rival fiat currency. They would rival fiat currency even more because central banks and governments being in each other's pockets these days, the one, the government, spending more money than it's got, and issuing lots of debt, and the central bank buying that debt and printing money, thus degrading the value, the intrinsic value and the quality of the currency. That is a motivation for people to want to get out of the way of governments and central banks and look for alternative forms of currency. And that is potentially a digital currency, which is not a central bank digital currency, but a private sector digital currency. Now, our thesis is that, that is a process which will gain traction, but we do not expect it to happen by tomorrow morning. On the contrary, central bankers around the world and governments around the world, irrespective of their legitimacy, are actually dumping in a nuclear fashion on private sector digital currencies because they see them as an alternative power source, which could rival their power source and their monopoly over the provision of fiat currency. And they're quite right to do so. But as long as they behave the way they are behaving, it is most unlikely that the trend towards alternative currencies and alternative assets, in other words, digital currency and digital assets in the private sector will not go away. And I would think that within five or 10 years, some private sector digital currencies will have gained sufficient network to be a credible alternative, not only for transactions and the measurement of value, but also as an investment asset to traditional currencies controlled by governments and central banks. That is the background to the remarks I'm going to make. Now, that is not to say that I'm a, a fool, though I may be a fool, um, but I do see dangers. One of the major dangers is that private sector digital currencies 
are controlled by private companies, which are driven by individualistic greed. In other words, it is greed, not policy, that controls what will actually happen to a digital currency, particularly if there is some sort of crisis. Even when a digital currency, private sector, is backed by assets in the form of a stable coin, which means that the exchange rate between the asset that backs it and the digital currency itself is fixed. The fact that it is in control by a private sector, which does not control the supply of the assets that back the currency, and the fact that the motivation of that private sector is essentially greed, and of course, harvesting the data of people uh, to further their own business models by selling it or exploiting it for advertising reasons. That is not reassuring because whatever uh, the bad things that I have said and can say about the control of fiat currency by governments, which together with central banks are pretty doubtful in uh, how they actually provide uh, backing for a fiat currency. Despite that, they are driven by policy whereas private sector digital currencies are in the end driven by individual company ownership of them and the greed of the individuals involved in those countries. That is before you come to the fact that cryptocurrencies, private sector digital currencies present for as long as they are as volatile as they are, systemic risks to the financial sector if they were to take over the role of feared currencies. There's no doubt about that. And that is a major negative. And then of course you come to to what extent are digital currencies responsible citizens. And you only have to look at Bitcoin, which uses the same amount of energy as Holland or many emerging markets to say that this is ridiculous. Most of that energy, most of that electricity is actually generated by coal. And that was particularly the case in China until recently when it was banned. That is a big bad blot uh, on the copybook of uh, Bitcoin. And it is one of the primary reasons I personally would not invest in it, despite the fact that its supply is limited by the amount of Bitcoins which can be mined. Uh, going into the future. I, uh, it is just not something I would want to own. The other way in which uh, uh, private sector digital currencies are socially responsible is that their hardware only lasts about a year. And because the chips involved in their hardware are tailored to purely mining a cryptocurrency, they are useless for any other purpose and cannot be recycled. So the box that is contained in the aluminum in, in which it is structured and the silicone chip or the processor itself is thrown on a scrap heap. And that also is the untold story of how cryptocurrencies damage the environment. That's the background. Now let us come to China. China is in many respects well ahead of other countries, of its peers, in introducing a central bank digital currency, which is actually in operation. How this actually works is that the digital currency is not issued to individuals by the central bank the People's Bank of China, the PBOC. So individuals do not have accounts with the PBOC. The PBOC issues the digital currency, just like a fiat currency, to the commercial banks who are, of course, state controlled. And those banks credit or debit the digital currency, the central bank digital currency, to the accounts of individuals. But the accounts of those individuals are not at present time directly controlled by the state. However, going down the road, 
it is highly likely in China, as well as in other countries, that central bank digital currencies will become a quasi fiscal and monetary tool. Let me give you an example. Let us say that the economy is operating below capacity. So it's kind of deflationary and you need to get things going again. Well, the temptation will be great in a world in which central banks and governments are simply the back door and the front door of the same building. The temptation will be very great to actually use individual accounts with the central bank. You want to create demand. So you credit those accounts with X amount per individual of central bank digital currency. And that central bank digital currency has to be spent. You could even specify on what it has to be spent by a certain date. So all the problems which we have seen in which central bank stimulus measures, uh, printing based money, translating it into uh, a transfer to banks, but then it stops and it might become asset price inflation, but it does not become final demand. All of that is overcome by using a central bank digital currency. The temptation is very great to do that. It is not just in China, it is anywhere in the world. I suspect that that is the next step in the way in which fiscal deficits, output gaps, and I can go on, will be financed by a mixture of fiscal policy and digital currency. Now let us dwell for a second on why China has banned Bitcoin and all other private sector digital currencies completely. First of all, China, as we know, and I have just done a video on it, has got a power crisis, which is of major proportions and a very real macroeconomic risk. China does not want to have the currency like Bitcoin using up its power supply because it doesn't have enough of it. Secondly, a private sector Bitcoin rivals state policy, which is to have an RMB and a central bank digital currency anchored firmly under the control and in the institutional framework of the state. If it's a private sector, type of digital currency, then it escapes the state completely. And that is not something which is going to happen in China. The use of private sector cryptocurrencies in China cannot be monitored or controlled. In other words, the data lies outside the control of the government and the central bank. Well, we have just lived through the introduction and implementation of three major data laws and umpteen interventions in the private sector over the last 12 months, which point the way clearly that there is not going to be accumulation of data in private hands. It belongs with the party. It belongs with the government. The government and the party in that sense are indistinguishable. But China has woken up to the fact that data as much as concentrated wealth is an alternative source of power to the Communist Party. And it is. And it's an alternative source of power in Western rich countries and Eastern rich countries too. But in China, that is a strict line in the sand. It is simply not going to happen. Then we come to common prosperity. Private sector digital currency creates billionaires. We have all seen them. They are richer than they are advertising in the main, but that is not a general rule. China does not want billionaires because it rivals the values of wealth and income being 
more evenly distributed and earned by hardworking middle-class people who are the human drivers of common prosperity. So in an ethical and cultural way, private sector cryptocurrencies are anathema to the new concept of common prosperity. In fact, private sector cryptocurrencies are seen as being a gambling tool. And China does not want its young people become enmeshed and addicted to gambling, particularly gambling that is carried out online in cryptocurrencies. It has already acted to limit the access to these sort of activities online among its young people. Private sector cryptocurrency runs completely counter to that. Finally, and we, I will, it will be the subject of my next uh, discussion and video about cryptocurrency. China has ambitions in the international sphere, both for trade, financial transactions, and capital to replace the US dollar. So China wants to replace the US dollar. As far as China is concerned, the RMB and digital currency are indistinguishable. But digital currency could be used very quickly and easily for by Chinese tourists visiting, let's say, poorer Asian currency countries who have no choice but to accept it. And indeed, why would they not accept it if they are accepting tourists from China who spend RMB? Why would they not accept digital currency? So this would be a small but significant step in replacing the predominance of the US dollar in China's own trade and its own investment flows, as well as in the global system. Furthermore, on that particular note, I would add that countries in the Belt and Road Initiative who are highly indebted to China and other countries who may want to get infrastructure and other projects off the ground using Belt and Road, they would be tempted or maybe they would be forced to use RMB financing which is the case often, and to replace financing by the US dollar with both the RMB and digital currency. And finally, countries which can't sell their wares because they are embargoed, such as Iran, even though it may change, of course, want to sell their oil to China but they have to take the conditions that the Chinese are prepared to give them. And this oil is traded in RMB and thus can also be traded in digital currency. The overriding point here is that you can never separate the political and diplomatic aims of China globally from the economic policy tools which it uses for international engagement and digital currency will be no different. In my next video, I will deal with digital currencies and international finance on a more general scale, not just China, but the world, and why there is a strong argument, not just put by me, but by actually such venerable people as Carrie, who the ex Bank of England governor, that it would be beneficial to the world and particularly to developing countries if the US dollar was replaced by a digital currency. We will discuss that and who would own it and how would it operate. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please give us a like and we will talk again very soon.